worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, he holds the victory. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. Oh, we shout out your praise. Shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet, oh we shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, and we won't be quiet, oh we shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely Good morning. Welcome to OPC. Glad to see you here this morning. Love to see a few more faces. Are there announcements to be shared this morning? Well, I have one. As you should be aware from a little bit of talk last week, and it's in your bulletin, there will be an ice cream social and a hymn sing this afternoon at 2 o'clock. We're going to meet in here and we're going to sing a few songs and share some fellowship. And then I mentioned then we're going to have ice cream. Uh, so if any of you can make that, we'd sure love to have you. And if, if you can't make the ice cream part, you can make the hymn sing, that'd be great. Or if you can't make the hymn sing and you want ice cream, well, I guess we'd allow you to come. So two o'clock, please. If you would stand with me and Please greet one another in Christ's peace.
Will you join me in the call to worship? This is the day, and we shall praise you. This is your day, and we shall declare your name. This is your day, and we shall worship our risen Savior and King. Come, let us worship the Lord. This is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me.
If you would join me in the confession of sins found in your bulletin. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we confess that we have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we fall short of being a credible witness to you. For these things, we ask your forgiveness, and we also ask for your strength. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May God, who forgives all your sins, strengthen you in all goodness. And now we will be using the Apostles' Creed for the affirmation of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Isaiah, found in the 53rd chapter, verses 1 through 12. It can be found in your pew Bible on page 772. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord was laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. Yet who of this generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, 
nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see this offering and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteousness servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sign of many and many intercessions for the transgressors. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Children may be dismissed at this time, and we'll ask Pastor Bill to come forward. As always, it is, uh, it is good to be here, and uh, before we turn to our text, just a, a couple things that, that have caught my attention as we arrived this morning. Uh, first of all, the September newsletter is available. It's on the, on the back um, table. Maybe you received it at home. And I would encourage you, by the way, to read a, a message that I've pinned for the front page. It gives you a sense of, of some of what's going to happen in September without specifics. Now, your, your session, the elders are meeting this morning, and we're going to uh, flesh this out in per- terms of putting some dates to things and other plans. But we are coming into a season in the life of the church that is so important as we begin to move from early transition to our our next stage as we look forward to what God is going to do in the life of the church, especially in terms of the call of a new pastor in God's time. We've taken some important steps already. Some critically important steps are coming up, hopefully in the month of September. So pay attention to that. Um, Go online, talk, call, make sure that you are uh, up to speed with all that's going to be happening at OPC this coming month. And then secondly, uh, kudos, I don't know exactly to who, I have a feeling it's Nicole, it may be others, this little uh, violety, purpley uh, brochure on OPC, what a, what a great little item this is. And grab one of these, uh, read it, and then it might be something that you want to share with a neighbor or a friend about our life at the church, and what God is doing here. Good stuff. So if you haven't seen that, the, uh, the bright orange and, and the brochure, I would encourage you to pick one up and use it. Well, as we go to the Word this morning, we are in Philippians, Paul letters to the Philippians, chapter 2. Now, you may remember, it's been three weeks, that we looked at this same reading three weeks ago, especially the first half of it. God's strategy for the church to be a place of unity. We're going to read that again and then look especially this morning at the source of our unity. So hear God's word to us. This is Paul's letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. The apostle writes, So if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others as more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which you have in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, 
he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our Lord endures forever. So last time we, we looked at this great passage, and I think in it is a strategy for not just the first century church in Philippi, but also for the 21st century here in ASEAN, in the United States, and around the world. It is to, to live out our lives in what Paul will say is a manner worthy of the gospel, in such a way that, that our lives individually, and especially our life corporately, our life together, points to the good news of the gospel. Paul has said in chapter 1, his own experience of the gospel leads him to say this, that, that for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And then he goes on and says, brothers and sisters, and the, the church at Philippi is so beloved by Paul. He, he calls them shining stars. His great crown and joy. He loves the people in Philippi. He knows them well. He, he knows all their great attributes, but also some things that are bothering him about them. But he says to them, so let your life be a life that is worthy of the gospel. What a great question for us, each one of us, in our daily lives and, and us together as a church. Is it worthy of the gospel? This gospel that allows us to say that, that our life is Christ and, and even our death will be gain. So Paul knows the Philippians. He knows them well. He loves them. They're, they're a great church, a little church, a great little church. But he knows they've got a, a few problems and one of them is that there's some disunity in their church. In fact, later in the letter, he will actually call out a couple of members by name, two women, Yodia and Syntyche. Cut it out, he'll say. And so as he talks about a, a church that represents Christ to the world in terms of its unity and its fellowship, he's talking to a church that needs to learn that lesson. If there's any encouragement in Christ, and, and oh, there is. If there's any comfort from love, and of course we know there is. Any participation, that is fellowship in the Spirit, and of course we know there is. Then, complete my joy. Be of the same mind. Have the same love. Be in full accord in one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition, Euodia and Syntyche and others. But always count that other, the person in the pew, next to you this morning. The folks you'll see in, in fellowship time afterwards or at ice cream this afternoon. Count them as, one version says, better, more significant than yourselves. Don't look just to your own interests, but, but look to that other person's interests in, in all that you do. And so, we give witness to the gospel. I, uh, I like this little brochure. We have talked about our vision statement before. It's on the front panel. It's also in your bulletin this morning. We say that OPC exists. This is our vision of who we are. We have four reasons to be here. Why are we here? To praise and worship God. Number one, and always number one, and from our praise and worship, everything else will flow. Our purpose is to praise and worship God, to have a God-directed life. But then, secondly, it is to bring others into a saving relationship with Christ. How do we do that? What's our strategy? We're going to talk about that in just a, a minute. And then to, to help people, those of us in the pews on Sundays, to, to grow spiritually. How can, can you and I, and some of us with a, a long walk with Jesus, how can we continue to grow spiritually, to know him better, to, to see him more clearly, 
And as the old song said, to, to love him more dearly. That's our purpose, to, to grow in Christ. And then finally, we, we do good works, but as we've said, those good works that always point to our Father in heaven. One of the things that I'm, I'm doing in our presbytery is working with uh, what we call our church health committee. And we're creating a, a group of church health coaches that will go to various congregations in our presbytery and, and help them get healthier or healthier. And one of the things we, we say is, well, you've got to do a five-point alignment. Sounds like something you're going to do down at the car dealer. A five-point alignment. And that five-point alignment is to align first your perception of yourselves. Church, what do you think of yourselves? And, and sometimes churches think too highly of themselves. First Presbyterian Church, Ossian, the biggest and the best and most exciting church in Wells County, right? Right, yeah, but maybe not. But neither should we ever say, oh, we're just a bunch of, we've been around too long. Last person out, turn out the lights. That's not true either. A, a perception of who we are, who God has called us to be. And what he's calling us to do. That's then our vision. What is God calling us to do in this place at this time? What is God calling us to do in Ossian, Indiana in 2022 and beyond? Now we have a rich heritage and, and we can look back at it and, and give thanks for it. But our, our task, our vision is not to, let's recreate the 1960s and the 1980s. The 1990s, our task is to look into the rest of the 2020s and beyond and to know what, what is God calling us to do, that's us here, in this place, Austin, Indiana, at this time. And then we come up with a strategy. And I, and I think Paul's aware of that. In fact, I think Paul is talking to his Philippian friends about a strategy for living their lives in a world that doesn't know and is often opposed to Jesus Christ. And what's that strategy? The strategy is to be a family, to be a community of people who think of others first. Who look not only to their own interests, but to the interests of others. And I think that's, Jesus is all about that too. Remember, it's the very night he was betrayed in, in John 13. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also ought to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. That's a, a strategy for reaching the world, that we love one another. Sometimes in the church, we think our strategy has to be bigger and fancier and flashier. You know, smoke machines and, and light all over the place and, and a, a worship service that feels more like a concert. Jesus doesn't talk about that. He says, here's the strategy. Love one another, and by this the world will know. Not by your light shows, not by your smoke machine, by your love for one another they will know. Tertullian is a very early 3rd century, late 2nd century, uh, father of the church. Early Christian, lived in pagan Rome. This is before Christianity has any official recognition. They are a minority, an oppressed minority in the empire, surrounded by pagans. And Tertullian imagined, he said, this is what the church ought to be like. That the pagans ought to look at the Christians, and then he says this, they ought to say, look at how they love one another. And then Tertullian says, by the way, the pagans hate each other. Look how they love one another and how they are ready to die for each other. And then he says, by the way, the pagans, they themselves are readier to kill each other. In a divided, partisan, bitter world, sounds a little bit like ours. The Christians are to mark themselves not by their better arguments, not by their louder voices, but by their love for one another. That's our strategy. That's our witness to the world out there of loneliness and division and hurt and sorrow and pain. That we would be a, a community that loves 
one another. But then Paul says, there's only one way to do that. Not that we'd be focused on one another, but that we'd be focused on Jesus. And so he says, our text for today, starting at verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which you have in Christ Jesus. The only way that I can count the other as more significant than myself, that I'm willing to look for, for Ted's concerns as well as mine, is if I look first, not, not to Ted, but to Jesus. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. See, our, our goal in the church is never unity for unity's sake. Our goal is always Christ. Humble care for one another. That is a derivative, it's a fruit. It comes from our love of Jesus. I can love the other as I know the love of Christ. I can love the other all the better, all the more. I love Jesus. And sometimes the church gets confused about that. We make care rather than Christ our goal. I'm going to get a little political this morning. Governor of New York recently, uh, she's a practicing Catholic, raised and in, in, in claims to be a, a practicing Catholic, and yet she is, she is a, uh, a radical, rabid supporter of abortion, all the way up to and, and maybe even beyond the point of birth. And she was asked about that. How do you reconcile your Catholic faith with your radical views on abortion? She said, well, wait a minute. And then she, she used a curious phrase that I've heard before. She said, I'm a Matthew 25 Catholic. Well, what's that? That's become a, a popular phrase. In fact, yours and, and my former denomination uses that a lot. Oh, we're, we're Matthew 25 Christians. What does that mean? Matthew 25 is that passage about uh, the imprisoned and the hungry and the lonely and the sick who would come. We visited them. We brought them food. We suffered with them. The least of these, my brothers and sisters, Jesus said. There's a church saying, that's all we need to know. We will focus on care rather than on Christ. But we can't care unless we know Christ. We will, we will tire out, we will wear out, we will bitter out unless we're focused on Jesus. Because we are, after all, our great Protestant watchwords. We are, we are a people of grace alone, faith alone, Christ alone, Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. We will fail if, if our witness to the world is simply being nice, simply caring for each other, the world will see how we love one another only if we love Christ, only if we know Christ, only if we glory in Christ. And so Paul writes of Christ, have this mind among yourselves which you have in Christ Jesus. And then this is, this is heavy stuff theologically. Though he was in the form of God, he was God himself. Trinitarian, fully God. Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. The Greek word is kenosis, and, and we talk about this as the great kenosis passage, the empty himself. Who is Jesus? Second member of the Trinity. He empties himself of all the prerogatives of the, of the prince of the universe. He gives them up. By taking on the form of what? A king? A tech oligarch? A billionaire? No, he takes on the form of a servant. Being born in the likeness of men, of, like you and me. Merry Christmas. Incarnation. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The person and the work of Jesus, the person of Jesus, he is God, the second member of the Trinity, fully equal with God. The Son is equal to the Father, who is equal to the Son, though they are distinct persons, that mystery of the Trinity. What great good news, even, even when, we, when we can't quite understand it. 
He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, the work of Christ. The work of Christ is the work of the cross. I told you I was going to get a little uh, political this morning. Any of, you, any of you happen to know anything? Have you heard anything about this uh, student debt retirement thing? Maybe you've heard of that. Maybe you were upset with it. Some of us were. Now, I'm not going to give you my opinion on student debt retirement other than I don't think it's a good idea. But that's not the point. We can disagree in the church about that. But I can tell you my own reaction is one of frustration. I think it's bad public policy. I don't think it's just. I don't think it's fair. I don't like it. But then, and, and stay with me, don't walk out, then I read this as Paul talks about the work of Christ on the cross from Colossians, another prison epistle. You were dead in your trespasses. Methodists say trespasses, we say debts. And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by, what did Jesus do at the cross? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Now, I don't think this speaks of, of public policy in the United States in 2022. It's not about our crazy scheme to finance higher education. But it is a reminder of who we are. And I am scandalized by the forgiveness of debt. Those guys ought to pay their own debt off, right? We know people who have worked hard to pay off their debt. Why should other people get it forgiven freely? That's a scandal. And you know what they called the gospel? A scandal. Foolishness to the Greeks and scandal to the Jews. Why? Because, well, the Pharisees said you can pay it back yourself. The Pharisees said if we just do enough good works, we will earn forgiveness. And the gospel is a gospel of grace. I can't possibly pay the debt I owe to God, my creator. I have inherited a debt from my first parents, and I have willingly taken on more debt. This is not a student loan forgiveness policy. This is the reality of the gospel. It is scandal. At the cross, Paul says, he set this aside, the legal demands of the debt that stood against us, nailing it to the cross, the work of Christ is the work of forgiveness, the work of a canceled debt. You see, as we look at who we are, talk about an accurate perception of ourselves, here's what scripture says about us in part, that we were dead, that we are lovers of darkness rather than of light. I don't like to think about that. I love darkness rather than light, but but Jesus says that's true of me. That we are dust, dirt. We are dust, and to dust you shall return. We are the, the withered, faded grass. We are debtors. We are prodigals. And yet, the gospel is a gospel of forgiveness, of wholeness, of things made right at the high cost of the cross. And then Paul says, therefore, because the cross is so effective, and only the cross is effective, there is no other way than by the cross of Christ that we might be made right with God. And because the cross, because Christ was obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, now we can say, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Therefore, Paul says, therefore, because we have the Christ of the cross, God has highly exalted him, lifted him up, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the gospel 
a gospel of Christ and his cross, of forgiveness and freedom, of joy and of hope. And when we know Christ and his cross, we are free to care for one another. And that becomes our witness to the world out there. We belong to God. We are his. And through Christ and and the Holy Spirit, he has given us the ability to call God Abba, Father, Christ, our brother. Who are we as OPC? Well, first of all, we're Christians. We're Christ-focused. We're we're cross-centered. Above all else, we are Christian. We, We say in the old version, I believe in the Holy Catholic Church, we say the Holy Christian Church. We are Christians. And so are the Methodists, and so are the Baptists, and so are the Catholics. We are part of the church. God's called out people. Who are we? We are those whom God has called into relationship with himself through the gift of his son, Jesus. And yes, we are Presbyterian. That means we have a a Reformed theology, this rich heritage that sees God and sees the witness of Scripture as promise-keeping. We have a God who has made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and who has fulfilled those promises in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And we are Presbyterians. That is simply rule by elders. The pastor doesn't make all the decisions in a Presbyterian church. Thanks be to God. Elders who God has called from among the people. So we are, we are Presbyterian Christians, but we are Christians. Christ-centered, cross-focused. Christ is our center. The cross is our focus. And only so centered and so focused can we love one another in such a way that the world would say, my, how they love one another. This is how the world will know you are my disciples, that you have love for one another, Jesus says. Jesus Christ. He is the one and the only one, Christ alone. He is the suffering servant that Ted read about from Isaiah 53. He is born on our infirmities. He's carried our diseases. We accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted, but he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. Another not so flattering picture of us, folks. And we like sheep, dumb sheep. That's who we are. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one of us to our own way. And what did he let us go? Dumb sheep? No. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He is the good shepherd who goes after the one of 99. He is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the flock. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Philippians in the first century, the Ossians in the 21st century are called to unity not for the sake of of unity alone, but for the sake of Christ and the world he loves. Let's pray. God, we give thanks that you call us into relationship with yourself through the gift of your son, Jesus, and that it is in Christ alone that we learn how to care for one another, that we become that community of witness to the world, And so, God, yes, increase our love for one another, but more, God, increase our love for Christ. Help us to know him better, to to see him better, to serve him better, because we love him. We give thanks in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Are there joys or concerns to be shared this morning? Uh, Laura wanted me to pass on surgery was a huge success and wants to thank everybody for the prayers and the uh, calls that she received. Work. She will be to work tomorrow morning. <laughs> Are there other things to share this morning? Would you join together in singing 430, I Must Tell Jesus? Verse 1, please. join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the folks sitting in the pews this morning. We thank you for the message that Pastor Bill delivered. We thank you, dear Lord, that there are wonderful joys and concerns placed upon our hearts that we can turn to you for guidance, for assurance, for peace. We pray, dear Lord, for Laura, for Tom, for the family. We thank you, dear Lord, that things have gone smoothly. We pray for continued healing and, and a speedy recovery. And I'm sure, dear Lord, there are, there are unnamed individuals on the hearts of folks in the congregation this morning who also need lifted up to you, dear Lord. You know who they are. We pray for them, dear Lord. Give us strength that we might support those around us. Give us love and compassion. And as Pastor Bill said, may they know we are Christians by our love. If you join me now in the prayer that Christ taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you join together in singing hymn number 116, verses 1, 2, and 4, please.
Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Go now as God's people, declaring his goodness, his love, and his mercy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen and amen.